I know you've been through a lot in terms of policies. You know, I, uh, in New Zealand, it's a lot of tension, a lot of challenges in America too. You know, our biggest challenge is coming uh, up uh, when Trump becomes our president. You know, <laughs> that's we we don't know what's going to happen. In rain, we we don't we don't know. It's actually interesting, uh, which is itself an interesting question. How did Trump rise? You can't really blame him. You blame education. You blame people. Our school did not prepare the citizens to vote otherwise. You know, so people are celebrating. That's actually it's a, in a democracy. One of the reasons to talk about education is perhaps have a good citizenry, right? People who can decide what matters. You know, even you. Yes, he has money. He has all those things, but he says the stupidest things. But it is yet. But yet, he is so attractive to a certain group of people. If you watch him, you know, one thing he does very well, better than most of education professors like us, better than Andy Hargreaves, you know, better than Yong Zhao, he speaks at a, a fourth grade language level. Fourth grade. He repeats the same word. Oh, he is fantastic. I'm so rich. What can you do? Remember this? The, it's, I'm so, I'm just, he just repeats, I'm great, we're fantastic, he is fantastic, she is fantastic. He uses the same word, you notice that? I think NZEI needs to learn from that, how to promote <laughs> your, your, your mission. You got to promote your mission. Think about that. It's, it's a really important thing to think about. How do you pass the message? And when you use big words like constructionism, who cares? You know, what's constructivism? <laughs> you think about, who called, you know, moral purpose. You know, the fourth grader know what the moral purpose is? No, you just say justice over there, service, be good. Okay, so, so today, okay, uh, and, and uh, I go around really different countries, and one of the issues we, we, we face as school leaders today, as parents, as educators, is that uh, there's so many details we worry every day. There's so many that we worry, so we forget the big picture of education. I mean, every time I come to New Zealand, about every two or three years, you guys have some argument with the Minister of Education. You know, some kind of argument. You always have some kind of argument. I don't know why, I don't know how, but you're, now you're now arguing about the global budget. So educators, really, you face so many details, changing landscapes, new policies, and then you are really consuming a lot of energy. And of course, tomorrow morning you go home back to school, some parents will complain, oh, my child is not, doesn't like his neighbor, I would change a class. You get all those details. Today, I really want to invite you to Use the time, use your vacation to think about a, a big picture. Really, what matters, especially when you are as um, mid-level leaders. I don't know why you're mid-level. You look very top. I know. Look at it's, it's, uh, you. Look like top-level le leaders. But you know, But w why do we do this education business? And, and another thing is that you, because I, whenever I go, some people always say, "Okay, yeah, just tell me." something I can use. You know, I, when I go back to school, I can use now. I said, well, if I can do that, that's not worth your time here. You can pick up a how-to book. You know, the, how many how-to books in education? You know, if you go to a bookstore, right? You know, how do you do this? How do you do that? If you need, most often you don't need that. So, and also as leaders, you need to really think about how do you create a good education for all other people's children. The how is in your hands, you know, otherwise, you know, if you're a leader, you got to have something to lead towards, right? So you have to lead this whole thing. So what I think, you know, what have I learned in the last four or five years by going around, the really first thing I think I come to learn is this big thing. This is not my book. It's actually a book by Todd Rose. If you haven't seen this book, I suggest you read it. And, and Todd Rose is a professor of special education at Harvard University. And I've been using his research for a long time. What his argument is talk about, today we have to end the average. Average has many different reasons we call average. Number one thing is that he talks about, we design things for the average people. And so in, in our schools, you know, you know how we design for the average? We take children together, we think by age seven, they should be like this. They should have this level of literacy, this level of numeracy, this level of uh, emotional development. Then we design uh, one textbook, one syllabus, one classroom to fit them. And if you, the child doesn't follow that, it's a children, the child's fault. So we call that, you know, you're below average, you have a deficit problem. You know, that's how we call achievement gap. 
So he tried to illustrate how a system designed based on average doesn't work. He was talking about、uh, American military trying to design the best fighter, you know, fighter jet. And that's trying to the cockpit, and we designed the cockpit. So they took average of all these possible soldiers called big data. Be very careful, of big data. Big data is very dangerous. This is the how it's dangerous. You take thousands of people, okay? You average their height, their weight. Then you design the cockpit. You know the seat, the control. It doesn't work for anybody. Nobody is at the average. You notice that in school, nobody is. But but it was a good idea, right? The data. So be very careful with the big data. And people say, oh, government always use big data because they take all your children's data. You know your, I don't know, however, to maybe a million of your children, they average them. But nobody is at the average. You got to notice that this whole thing is very important to think about. So so that's the first thing to think about average. How our system can be redesigned. So think about this average. Can、okay, I notice this one? If you ask you the question, which one is larger, you probably can never answer that question. And then if you can say the the blue guy and the versus the red guy, you know they are all above or below average on some dimensions, on some dimension. So now you think about your children come to school, right? What do you do? You take their average. They want one score out of your student to say your child may be great. Just forget about their physical appearance. Think about their other abilities. They may be great. They may be a hundred percent, a hundred fifty percent in math, but they could be zero percent, zero worst in language. You average them out a hundred and zero, you get fifty. The other person can be complete flipped. You know, the hundred percent on language, zero on math, you still get fifty. Are they the same child? But our school, we always think about the same child. You know, the same. So today, my strong message: if you think about the purpose of education, I think one of the purposes of education is about help every individual child reach their potential. So how about we think about education institutions? Not as something to make judgment about other people, but to support other people in their reaching their own potential. So this is the one of the purposes. And now you keep this image in mind. I'm going to ask you to think about how many ways we can differ. Children can differ, and how many profiles you can build. You know, traditional education, you build this average profile for success. You tell people if you did this and this and this three things, you get this, you'll be successful. Remember, that's our education called national standards, national curriculum. That's why you're asked to do this because they think if you can deliver math, I mean, literacy, numeracy, and something else, you'll be great. We call that construct the profile for children's success, and we've been doing that, by the way, for many many years.、Uh, for example. This is what, by the way, called national curriculum attempt. That we have.、Uh, do you know how often you guys are asked to construct a profile for success? I mean, you've been told this thing: how to be a successful leader, three things to do. Remember those three things, to, you know? And then this is like, how to be a successful in a Kiwi, five things to do. You have all those books, right? You know, how to become a book. How do you? How to? I don't know. There are so many how-to books, but I will give you this one.、Uh, so in, in our learning, we always talk. How the child becomes ready? Now this is the PISA model. You need English language arts and literacy and numeracy. That makes you successful. And now you have 21st century that comes to tell you it's called.、Uh, it's this going to be called、uh, perhaps called creativity or not? English is called. You add English, math, social studies, science, and then some people would say, oh, maybe it's uh, it's it's uh, uh, critical thinking. The four C's. Have you ever heard of the four C's? Critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity, and and then some people say, well, for, to, to, for you to be successful, you need IQ and EQ. Remember those? They, they just kept arguing those things, and、uh, and for example, you say, okay, 20% IQ, 80% EQ. So according to actually, I go back to my my village. My father says actually there is a、uh, 15, 23% feng shui. It's a、uh, That's randomness in life, you know. Wherever your your grandparent、uh, is buried matters, you know. It's、uh, so I've been trying to search that as well. 
I have to tell you, this is a, an old attempt. We try to create an average profile for every child. So we think, if you did this, you will be successful. In business, we do the same thing. We summarize, how did Google succeed? How did Apple succeed? They have other companies learn from that. Everybody who learned from them did not succeed because they were copying the past. Remember, they, they were copying. Uh, this is, by the way, a lot of people may not like me saying that. I think Michael Fuller may not like me saying this because they try to prescribe a profile for every school leader, every student to succeed. But that's actually not true anymore. We did prescribe. We used, used to work because, remember, we had jobs ready for you. If I can prescribe everything for you, I can make a machine to do it. Because it's repetitive, it's not human anymore. You know, we used to be able to do it because we had a different kind of jobs. Different jobs like, uh, for example, you know what kind of jobs we had? We had, uh, remember this? You actually can describe. You can say, this job requires this much knowledge, this much skill, you really can describe. And in, we did that, that's our, how our schools worked. Remember we said, you know, if you want to succeed in college, you need this. That's a pretty bad college because it described as a job. You come to here, yes, the college is a job. You come here so you can do it. And we used to think school as a factor, as a job. Going to school is a like, job, so we have this called kindergarten readiness. If you want to succeed in kindergarten, you need to do this. It's kind of really silly idea. It's from a stupid concept, right? You think about, I go to school, I go to kindergarten, you're supposed to help me. How should I be ready for you? If I'm not ready, what are you going to do with me? <laughs> the, a, a good education shouldn't do that. What, what I call, a good education should always be ready for children, wherever they are. But I think that's why you should go to government. Any national standards is a way to discriminate against people. But they had a reason to do it. They believe they prescribed something that will work for you in the future. That was the idea. It used to be like, so we used to describe the, uh, prescribe this. So you can prescribe, but now really you cannot do it anymore. It's a, you cannot prescribe. It's a, so in the traditional education, we basically try to turn all our children who are different into these people. This is our traditional education. And how do we do that? It was really a simple thing. It's you prescribe the curriculum. Teachers do the same. Schools do the same. We, we have been in this mindset. We really believe, genuinely believe, if I just prescribe something, if you acquired it, you will really be successful. We actually genuinely believe that. That's why in your school, a lot of teachers work so hard to make sure children learn what we want them to learn. We really do that, you know. I, I call that teachers today are like a UPS delivery person. Do you notice that, right? We, so the government gave you this package. You make sure you deliver to the children and then make sure they received it, they sign it, and you're done with it. That, that was you do, right? You see, so the, this package is called knowledge and skills we prescribe for the average person to succeed. And, but the, this is how we do it. So all this testing, all the assessment, so I would say today, our teachers work so hard to teach that they forget it's about learning. We worry a lot about teaching. We forget it's about learning. I, I, you know, if you come to think about it, sometimes it's almost absurd. A child comes to school. I mean, I can tell a real story. My, my, my children you know, grew up in America as uh, good Chinese. You know, good Chinese people should send their kids to weekend Chinese schools. That's good Chinese people do, you know. So I want to be a good Chinese. They said, okay, go, go there. So we go there. I mean, really, like us, we want them to be fluent in Chinese. Great. But the teaching was horrible. They hated it. <laughs> so for me, you know, every Saturday, I got to get up, drag them up, and send them to school. And, you know, I mean, inviting hatred from my children. <laughs> do you notice that it was... And also, the more they go to Chinese school, the more they hate Chinese language and Chinese people. It, <laughs> now, you want to think, is it worth it? Then you really stand back to say, is it worth it to torture your children so much that they hate you, they hate language? Even if they, if they didn't go, at least they might have maintained a neutral attitude to Chinese language, right? They might, they might at least not hate it, you know, just it's... Uh, 
No, no, I'm, I want, I'm really want to invite you to think about your children. So when you are fixing your children age five or six, you feel you invite them to hate this society, hate you, hate this school. Is it worth it? But we think it's worth it, we, so we want to teach you. Because we have this attitude, we want to help you succeed. Are you helping them succeed or are you torturing the child in such a way? So I want to think about th this whole idea. Now I want to go back to talk about the diversity differences because today I want you to really think about how many different ways you can be as an individual. Forget about the same success. Nobody succeeds in the average profile, okay? Nobody succeeds. That, that's what, you know, I was uh, showing this little picture. You, you can ask yourself, for example, you know, you, this is multiple intelligences. So do, are you 20% musical, 20% you know, a physical, 20% math? Is this going to make you successful? Or can you be more like, for example, maybe I will forget about it. I'm just, I'm completely stupid in math, uh, but I'm really good with music. Will that work? Just think about your, the same, the, the, yourself in, in a different ways to, the different profile, the same thing with uh, creativity. Are you 25% in creativity, another 25%? Or should you be, how about this? I'm extremely creative, but I'm horrible at collaboration. I don't like people at all. <laughs> well, that's Steve Jobs. You notice that? It's, it's, do you notice the whole thing? This is something you really have to think of because traditionally, the traditional job wants you to be mediocre at everything. I mean, really, if you go to assembly line job, it's mediocre. Bit ochre, mediocrity works fine. Average works fine. But today that may not. So how many different ways we vary? We vary in, in terms of uh, physical attributes. You know, physical attributes. Physical attributes really have no meaning. None of the natural variation has meaning until you put into a context. In a certain culture, for a certain job, for example, if you want to play for football, I mean rugby, actually bigness matters, right? Height matters. It's, it's good, you know, so that's something. But you know, the same if you are playing ping pong, I don't think those big guys will work very well. Do you notice the whole thing? So suddenly it has a difference. The same thing with, you know, we call skin color. Skin color, you know, in some cultures, they just say, okay, like in Chinese, think everybody should look very pale, that's good. That's, you know, so that's why Chinese people still hold umbrellas whenever they have, it's possible. Do you guys notice that? They want to keep their skin. In America, they try to be as, as tiny, tiny as possible, right, tan. And so they try to, they don't do any of those things. And, uh, and you know why? Culture, because Chinese people think whiteness or pale indicates you're, you're, you're more wealthy than other people. You don't have to do physical labor. So that you, Americans think only rich guys can, except, can go play on the beaches to get suntan. So, so it's a different story, right? It's a, so that, that's how people interpret. But then once everything in a culture, it actually shifts the value. But really it had no value. It really had no value. But then culture does that. So in China, you know, of course, umbrella sells very well. If, you, if you're into business, right? You go there. America, it doesn't. It's just called those... Uh, what they call those, uh, those uh, ultraviolet uh, light cells in America. It's kind of stupid, right? It's, uh, you live in the Montana, you're in snow, but you want to have this tan, so you buy those lights you know, to, to shoot on your skin. Uh, it's, I can't believe when I go to America, they actually have those places people want to go. It's, anyway, so, so think about physical attributes. This is a w only one dimension. But even physical attributes has a lot more different dimensions, right? Yes. So, and then, I was showing you about intelligence, human talents. This theory has been there for a long time, but how do you understand it? A lot of people, I think, understood it from the angle, yes, I am more musical, therefore I learn better with music. That's not, actually, that's not the original meaning. The original meaning basically means we are differently talented. This theory came from Howard Gardner in the 1980s, in opposition to the called one IQ theory. Because we used to believe, oh, he is smart, it may, measure by IQ. In the IQ test, IQ test is only a measure of really three things, your basic literacy, numerous, and spatial cognition. You manage those things. And by the all the big tests, like IQ, like the PISA, all your, 
actually correlates with IQ. So you're still measuring one dimension. It's that, are you smart? You're only smart in that way. And we drew bell curve. You remember bell curves on those things based on that? So if you use one dimension, you have the bell curves. People, some people always be above others. The bell curve idea. Uh, I have a lot of bell curves for you to think about. Okay, this is one bell curve called IQ bell curve. So based on this bell curve, the Asians are smarter than others. We use this to colonize, we use this to depress other people. So you are not, remember this is only one type of bell curve. Now if you draw a bell curve based on the other intelligences, let's say music. How many great musicians have you seen from Asia? Remember China has 1.4 billion people. We're not very good at how many great basketball. We got one Yao Ming, everyone will celebrate, you know. That's, <laughs> China still hasn't entered any, so, won any soccer game, you know. Just you notice those things? It's, so it's, if you draw on those, it's very different. It's very different. I mean, like if you put me to play foot so, rugby, I'll be crushed tomorrow, you know. Just, it's, it's, you, know. you have to think about different bell curves, okay. So the bell curve, when we talk about this one, it's called IQ. So when they say you are musically talented, what does it mean? It means you have the potential to become great in music and you learn faster in music, okay? It means two things. You learn faster and you can become truly great in that domain. This, is a, this does not deny the idea that everybody can learn anything. Everybody can learn anything, but how fast and how far you can go is very different. For example, we all sit here. I do believe this is called the growth mindset, right? We all can learn. I believe every one of us here can learn to paint. We can draw. We can learn to draw. But most of us will not become a Picasso. Would you agree, right? We can learn. We can all learn. So music, same thing. You know, I, like, I can learn to sing. I'm sure I can, you know, given some try, you know. But I am not going to become a Lady Gaga or Justin Bieber. I know that for sure. Right? So, so this doesn't, they, they do not go against each other. And traditionally, it doesn't really matter. If you learn the basics, I mean, like, you know, we talk about you guys singing. Everybody in the tribe can sing. How good can they be? You can put up with a lot of, not so good singers, right? Just it doesn't matter. It's a, and, but how good they can be, the kind of lead that differs, right? That needs talent. It's called music type potential. Again, traditional education, we never worried about this stuff because everybody can learn to basic. We just want you to be mediocre, old society. So this is something really important for you to look at. When children come to your school, they have this differences in music, in art, in, in math, and by the way, this multiple intelligences, this category, don't be fooled by this category. These are just convenient categories. There are talents you have not even discovered. Somebody may just be good at one tiny little thing. We just don't even know those people. Okay? So this is one domain. And then we have another source, which I don't think I've shared a lot with you. It's uh, the idea of um, motivation. I hope you really take this in mind. Remember now, physical attributes, cognitive talent, and motivation or passion. We are differently motivated by, by uh, different, I mean, you actually are born to pursue different things in life. Different things matters to different people. Okay, there are about 17, 16 basic human motivators. I mean, 16 things all human beings pursue. By the way, about 14 of them pursued by animals too. So this is human instinct. We want them. And the captures all of human beings, but each individual have a different profile. Different pro like for example, some of you are more interested in pursuing power. Okay? So maybe like for example, you are really care about power. You don't care about anything else. Have you noticed in your, among your children? If you get five kids together, one of them is gonna be, want to be the boss. I mean, yeah, well, you know, in your school too, once you have a staff of five, someone is going to tell you what to do. You know, they may not have the, the, the re but they just enjoy that. When we say motivator means, you're motivated means you are really driven by this. You actually gain energy if you can do it. Some kids, but at the same time, plenty of children simply won't be told what to do. 
Have you noticed that, right? It's, now, if you, if you go through the whole process, some children are much more curious than others. We used to believe, we like to believe all children are curious. No, they're not equally curious. You, you've seen some children can actually enjoy asking a question, why, all the time. They can sit there enjoying watching, understanding why rivers flow. They want to know. They will look at every new thing in your school say, oh my God, when did that happen? There will be plenty of other kids who have not even noticed. Oh, did that happen? Really? You know, curiosity. And then some people, let's say for example, are very much into order, organization things. Have you seen that in, in life? Those are the people who get really annoyed if you do not put the pencil on the right side of the table. <laughs> Remember, if the pencil is not arranged by the length, they get really angry. It's, have you seen those people? And, and you will, you, they will actually probably get mad at you if you put the coffee cup on the wrong side. It's, or you do things out of order. They have an order of things, right? You put this thing first, next one. It's, this is actually people really enjoy that. They, I mean, you, if you watch the American sitcom called uh, uh, The Big Bang Theory, there's a guy called Sheldon, you know, who he gains energy by organizing stuff. It's, uh, and then, you know, some people are very much driven by the idea of, uh, of collecting things. Collecting things. They just enjoy collecting. And those are the people who refuse to throw anything away. You know, just, those are the people on the, in the, on the email, on the email, they may have 5,000 email messages. Most of them have been read, they just won't delete. You know, just, <laughs> Might use that tomorrow. You know, just it's, uh, it's so so so. Think about you, you, yeah. You, you have uh, those people. You have those kids too. They, and at the same time, you have plenty of kids who just nothing gets you know kept. Right? They just they're gone. And so, understand this: sixteen different possibilities, and how many variations you can be. If you understand this, by the way, you really enjoy a better life as a teacher, as a leader, as a spouse at home or as in-laws, you know, actually it's really good, you know, because you know people want, don't want the same thing. It uh, gives you better, you know, kind of called domestic tranquility. I hope you really remember that this. Uh, it's really important. Before that, because you, if you can understand people actually gain energy. Again, this does not mean people cannot be forced to do things different. They can always be forced to do it. They just don't enjoy it, and they do not do it as easily. As, and for example, I'm, I really can't, I'm, I don't care about order. I can't be taught to organize things, especially when, when my wife is present. I say, yep, I'll do it, you know, okay. But whenever she is not there, you know, oh my God, you know, it's, uh, things change, you know, just. Uh, so it's not, I, I cannot do it, I really can't. She said, well, it takes two minutes to put this back together. I said, I know, but it's so hard. It's, that two minutes is very hard because it's not something I like doing, okay. So, so this is, I'm just going to give you this whole thing. You know, like, uh, for example, most of us don't understand movement, physical movement. It's really hard for me to understand. Now, I live in, in Oregon, where people really run around. In, in, I came from a village in China. It's, uh, for me, it's hard to understand why people run around for nothing. <laughs> Do you know, you know they, they wear very expensive sh shoes, you know, ni the birth of Nike place. They have this carefully curated and kind of called Amazon Parkway in that road. They just run around. It just is, you say, why? You know, in, in, in a village, we, we, we run for a purpose. You know, we run to something good, run away from something bad. But, but, <laughs> but here, you, you, they run around. You get, and they exhaust, they carry expensive bottles, drink the water. Say, what are you doing? And, and why do you do this stuff? You know? Now you say, okay, they just want to exercise the body. Our ADHD kids like that. We gain energy by moving. You know, people say, why do you keep moving? People gain energy. So from the 16 motivators, you can see how different we can be. Now, I'm just putting this back together. Physical, IQ, or intelligence, and emotion. They let us know passion. I'm sorry, let us know about your personality differences. You look at uh, our personality differences. Think about the f big five. Extroverted, introverted, right? It's, but so, so can you imagine how many difference one individual can be already? There's five, and there's another dimension. Your family background, your relationship, your social network, and where you grew up. Because all this are natural born, nature, and, and add nurture. If you go to, are born into a different village, what happens? 
in a different village and different school in a different country, people celebrate different things. So all those members is like your height. It doesn't really matter until it's in the culture. So in some cultures, for example, they celebrate a more extroverted person. So the extroverted person are judged to be better. You know, I think that might be, you know, stereotypical. It might be Italy. You know. Uh, in China, they can, you're considered a horrible person, destruction, you know, just, uh, and you'll be suppressed. You know? The same thing with uh, the motivations. Some culture celebrates, for example, more of this uh, power, people who are into power, like, for example, celebrate this thing. Uh, and in some culture, celebrates independence, but some culture discourages independence. In action on this Chinese culture, discourages independence. We want you to be relying on others. The parents always do this thing. Actually, we said, oh, you're too young to be independent. We want to keep this thing, so we don't do this thing. We'll, we'll keep you forever, you know, but that doesn't work that way. It's, so, so different cultures celebrate different things, and different jobs require different things. For example, you know, in organizing things. Schools love people, kids who can organize. School hates kids who are curious. You know, schools, we don't like kids who are curious, you know, just, just do what I will tell you. Why did you ask that question? Remember those things? It's a, so every society actually celebrates different things, and this basically means we, once, if a society or school or community makes a judgment about what's valuable, what's not valuable, we redefine the asset. How do we redefine it? For example, if we decide to say, okay, we, uh, we think, in a society, we think um, logic smart, that's numeracy, uh, is important. What do you do? You celebrate those kids who are good with math. You create more opportunities for kids who are good at math. And then you put them on the top level of bell curve so they get more and more developed. And then you deprive children of opportunities who don't you know, those kids who don't like math, they have no opportunity, they're considered to be lower, and they have to be fixed. Remember that? They're trying to fix them. We, we are, we're good people, we're nice people, we want to fix you. So remember that, that you're not good in math, we think math is good, and then you have an achievement gap. They want to fix your math so you can catch up. But now from the theory we just said, can you really catch up? You can never catch up. That so achievement gap is like a trap. It's a trap for everybody. For you, we think we're fixing, like in America, we're trying to fix the achievement gap for the African Americans, for the minorities, for the immigrants, for the poor. You can never catch up because the guys, they're already talented in this area. Their family gave them all, but more opportunities. They're three years before you or seven years before you when you go to school. How can you catch up? Unless they don't do anything weak for you, right? And remember, the rich people are always going to do more. So you can, there's no way to catch up. Now we need to rethink about the whole model. How do we change? How do we rethink? Okay, so it's really a trap. It traps people to believe, traps the policy makers to say, focus on achievement gap helps you help the poor people to get better. It cannot be, you know, that one thing. We've seen that, actually, which, the gap has never been closed. In America, we've been trying to close the gap for 30 years. It's getting bigger and bigger, okay? Second thing, it traps the child. It makes the child believe he is really bad. Remember, the child believes, I cannot do anything. I'm trying to close the gap. So we teach our children called self-learned, I mean, learned self-helplessness. That's something really big. It's a, and all they become develop hostility towards the society, the system, they feel left behind. It traps parents, traps teachers, feel like they are doing something good, but when they're doing the harm. So how do we get out of that? This is the challenge. How do we get out of it? Luckily, actually, it's time we can get out. It's really good now. And it is the same thing that causes trouble that brings us good, uh, great things. It's called technology. Okay? Technology has caused so many problems for us, for society. Technology advancement. Because right now in New Zealand, in, as everywhere, you probably have seen a lot of conversation talking about how Traditional jobs are gone. If you've seen this, traditional jobs are gone. You have a lot of people go to Australia, and the Kiwis live in this country, go to other places, finding jobs, you know, the traditional jobs, really. I have to tell you, traditional jobs, 
no matter what kind of job, if you can prescribe, describe the job and proceduralize it, make it like procedure, it will be replaced by machines. And this is, uh, uh, last time I was here, I just saw this book called uh, The Second Machine Age. That's the basic new technology, replacing traditional repetitive jobs. Now, a new term, you can use this term, is called the fourth industrial revolution. It's a, uh, here's the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, it's cool. So what is the, what's the fourth industrial revolution? You have to think about, um, in first industrial revolution started in by the steam engine. The second by electricity. And both revolution created a lot of homogeneous jobs. Our education was developed to help them. So that is uh, a while back, there's some data for you to, to consider. That is uh, a while back, you look at this, is called paradigm shift. In the 1800s, first and second industrial revolution turned a lot of independent farmers, peasants into workers. And modern school, our school, was built to serve that purpose. So that's what we can prescribe. This job requires you to know this. This job requires you to be able to do this. So that's how it happened. And then you see the decline, see the blue line, the declining? That's around 1950s, 1970s. That's called the third industrial revolution, started by computers, by robotics, by automation. Automation, that started, if you are old enough, you might remember the first ATM, the machines, that replaced bankers. That's first, that's in the 1970s. Remember, that, that's the first line of things. Uh, and then the day before, uh, Sunday I came in, I found in the airport, Auckland Airport, machines has replaced your immigration officers. Have you noticed that? That's the fourth industrial revolution because it requires more data and smart machines. You think immigration is a big job. No, no, we just have used machines. You, you walk, you walk in, how long, how long have you been doing this? Only recent, November, it wasn't like this, but this time, just very recent. Those immigration officers had university jobs, degrees. They were high paying, you know, I'm sure you're happy to get rid of them, but it's, but, but, <laughs> but, but I'm sorry for the, for these people. I mean, think about these jobs. Uh, accountants, lawyers, doctors, medical doctors. Do you know we're losing me a lot of medical doctors have to become more human now. Just prescription can be done by machines. It's, it's, it's changing a lot. So this is really the shifting. It's called fourth industrial industrialization. It's called the age of smart machines. Age of smart machines. And the machines can really be smart. You know how smart they can be? If you can give them a problem, a machine can be designed to solve very complex problems. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, Google's AlphaGo defeat the, China, uh, the Korean Go player? The, 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 it's more complex than chess. And, you know, of course, a machine, Deep Blue, beat it, someone playing the Americans' uh, Jeopardy game. A machine defeated that. So if it's knowledge, if it's a problem, can be isolated, it can be solved by machines much more efficiently than human beings. It's, uh, and, of course, you've seen this uh, recent uh, argument about autopilot. You know, Tesla's autopilot, that's not a, a true driver's com, uh, car yet, but it's all doing pretty good. You know, the, actually the crash has to do with more of the other driver. That's kind of a legal issue. So we will see, in essence, any job we prepare our children to do will be gone and actually have been gone. That's why nobody has jobs right now for youth. No country is happy with their youth employment. This is really tough time. So it's not, it's not our education. So when people blame you to say, oh, your education has been of lower quality, no, that's not true. I'm actually Australian education. Everybody is educated. We're doing better education than before, but we're just doing the wrong type of education. We're doing the wrong. So we, we still, remember the old model still on prescribe something, gift every child, make sure they're average, that's what, why PISA is wrong. They're all measuring these things that we think children should do. We hold them back. We stifle their, we, we don't believe children can be exceptional in their own way. You know, any testing, any standards, 
is actually a way to hold kids back. Remember, you are always judging kids against someone else's prescription. But today, I mean, that used to be working because when you're looking for employees, yes, you meet my expectation, you can work for me. But in the future, that's going to work because those will be done. If you can prescribe something, machine can do it. How do we deal with machines? So this actually combines with what I was talking about. Today, our children do not have to be reduced to machines. We used to reduce our children to mechanical devices, do machines job. Now they are freed. You know, who, does, who wants to drive a lorry five days a week? Remember, you would get somebody else to drive it. Remember, those, now actually we have machines to drive those uh, uh, ocean-going um, cargo uh, ships in about four years. We're gonna, I mean, you don't want to be away from your family. You'll be on for five months on the ocean, you know. But now machines will do it. They will drive those things. So it's a good thing we're losing those jobs. But it's a bad thing if we do not change our education to teach our children to live in a new society. But luckily, actually, if we can shift, it's good for both. Human beings are diverse. Technology does create new opportunities for diversity of talents. So I'm going to try to come to, to think about this. The big change of this is rising productivity for human beings. If we lose a lot of jobs, so we become much more productive. Do you notice that we are much more productive now? We have like 3% of people in farming who are making more food than ever before. You know, we, we may have in, in America, for example, you see this uh, productivity. In America, for example, the jobs in manufacturing has lost a lot. You look at the blue line, but we have been making more cars, making more stuff. We just don't need this thing. Now, as, as that, and you lose job, but what we're doing, you gain something, all of us in developed countries. We gain more leisure time and more disposable income. We don't have to work as hard and for as long as before. My father in my village in China, you know, because he's 90, you know, he's 90 over there. He has lived a life of necessities. You know, can you imagine about that time? In the village, you really have to spend all your hours securing your necessities, food, shelter and clothing. You don't have leisure time. Remember, maybe we have like Chinese Spring Festival, three days. And just, that's, that's about it. It's a, and so now, in developed countries, think about how much more leisure time you have. I know your teachers work hard. Okay, you, you do. But I think most people, you work eight hours a day, five days a week. How many more hours you have left? That's called leisure time. And you have vacation time. You have all those kind of things. And then you have more disposable income. You don't spend all your energy securing necessities anymore. You have more disposable income, like you spend perhaps half of your, half. You mean you don't even need to spend half for necessity. If you just want your physical survival in New Zealand today, you can probably spend very little money. I know actually there's a news report about an American graduate student, postgraduate student, spend $55 a year only. The rest he found in garbage cans. It's pretty good, actually good food. He said that now he's trying to have a new challenge. He wants to spend five dollars and only eat vegetarian next year. <laughs> you know, think about necessities. So now you have more leisure time, you have more, you have more uh, uh, disposable income. You know what changes? You consume different things. You consume different products and different services. This is really important for us to keep in mind. What do you consume today? Most of the things you consume is psychological, spiritual, aesthetic, intellectual. Just look at the stuff you consume. You read books, you go travel, you know, you run around, you know, you can do all those kind of things. It's, uh, uh, you go to music, you listen to this. Look, wh where do you spend most of your money now? Money to take care of psychological and spiritual needs. And once you consume your spiritual psychological needs, what, what they become? They become extremely personal. Every, everything psychological is personal. It's neat. So you, that's why we have how many, uh, look at your, how many musicians, how many singers you have on your iPhone or smartphones. You know, about 5,000 songs there. You, you can, it's different. So what ultimately we consume, I call what I call choice. There's something really important to keep in mind. Now, anything today in the new age, we consume choice. 
We consume so many different kinds of choices because choice is called personal. And I cannot, you know, I always have to give you this example so you can keep in mind. Choice, shampoo. And when I went to America, I did not, I was not able to buy shampoo because I did not know what kind of hair I had. <laughs> do, you, do you know that? You, you know? You have to know oily, normal, or dry, right? It's a, but for me, it never mattered when I was in, in China. I had, this is before, in the 1990s, it was still age of necessity. You had one bar of soap for everything, you don't have to worry about this. Now, can you imagine how big an industry the hair or cosmetic has become? Do you notice that, right? It's personal. And it's not only personal, can you imagine all kind of talents we need? If you did this, one type of talent, chemist, they put this whole thing together. Actually, when I was growing up, we did not even have this. We actually go to one type of tree, we just grab them, we just need one local person who knows that tree can wash things. And now here, can you imagine all the different talents we use? Artists who design the bottles, but by the way, they design most of stuff does not really matter for survival. The, the color, the shape of the bottle. You know, can you ever thought about the square bottles now? You know, I just remember what well, bottle can be square. Remember those different materials, scientists, artists, those people love to organize stuff. You know, uh, those people who love to, you know, who, and actually in this one is people you need scientists, nature people who can discover new ways to wash your hair. You like those people who can talk, who can convince you this is a better way to wash your hair. Remember those things? And those who study the different kind of shapes, different colors. This is the whole shifting. Every human talent on this whole spectrum can be of value. This is the first written lesson I want us to understand. So when you look at your child, every child action is of great value. So you do not try to tell them what you should learn. You say, okay, how can I help it become better in your own way? Okay, and this is, uh, is, is traditional. It's what, what used to be of no value has gained value. Uh, you probably remember the story of, uh, you know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Okay, so Rudolph, remember Rudolph was uh, laughed at because of his red nose. It was nobody wants to play reindeer games with them. If according to national standards, which describes the nose should be black. So, so Rudolph had an achievement problem, right? Achievement gap, right? His nose is not black enough. But then suddenly one day on the foggy Christmas Eve, Santa Claus needs a GPS. Right? They said, Rudolph, why don't you work for me? Changed. Rudolph suddenly gained value. A lot of people gain value for this. Newscasters, writers, designers, artists, everything. So today, you know, you, art actually is a good example. Think about art as a good example. And this is because, uh, you know, uh, dyslexia. Dyslexia is, has always been a, a big problem because uh, it's considered a deficit. Dyslexia interferes with reading. So traditionally, it was like, you cannot read. I want to fix you because you can, I want you to be able to read. That's necessary. But today we found dyslexia hides at the talent of art. They become great artists. But 100 years ago, art was not very valuable. But today, everybody consumes art. You know, you go to all the restaurants here, you know. The more money you pay, the less food you get. <laughs> because it's an artistic experience. I've been paying for the artistic experience the last few days. It's, uh, it's, uh, but if you think well, only, if you only just want that piece of food, you don't care about the server, the service, the decor. I mean, the food costs nothing, right? Because you, can, you can just pay for $5 of food, but you'll be, end up paying for $50 because it's art experience. Okay, that's better. So, so question number one for us to think today is we do not need, we do not need a general average profile imposed on all our children. What we need to do is to turn them into someone who they can be, their whole potential. But just their potential is not enough. Everyone has to be exceptional in their combination. So like, I may be really not very good with music, but let's say I'm 80% good at music, I'm 70% good with the art. If I combine them, I have a new 
talent. Do, do you see what I mean? But traditional, we, everyone wants to be 100% in math, you know, but you can't be. So how about you're just mediocre in math, but you're also mediocre in art, mediocre, and you combine three things, you have a unique thing. It's called, that, that's called creativity. Creativity is about being able to combine things. Being able to, I have to tell you this, the, the same story. You know, I'm a, you know, I, uh, I was really not good as a peasant boy. So, you know, so I was, uh, I was horrible. My father let me out. You know, he said, you're not very good, just you know, useless on the farm. Just go to do something else. So I went to study. And I, I went out. But my math was horrible. So I chose to study English. Okay. And, but I did not study, so this is something interesting, I did not study English literature. As all people major in English literature, I combined English and pedagogy when I was in China. But very few people did that. So that combination was perfect. And so then I created something new. So that's how you think about how do you create. And I was, first thing, as I mentioned, make sure every child can be considered valuable. I was kind of saying that it's a, a lot of traditional useless people have become useful. My best example, I always use Kim Kardashian as an example. Is a, <laughs> how the useless has become useful. Kim, Kim Kardashian, it's a, it's a, I mean she, how did she become useful? I mean, really, you may not even think she's useful, but she actually is useful to some people. She's like a bottle of shampoo. Somebody likes her, you know, just it's maybe a small percentage. <coughs> maybe a small percentage. But she can reach so many people. Remember those things? She can reach a global audience of 7 billion people. There's got to be someone who is crazy enough to like her. That's, <laughs> that's like when you, when you design new bottles, right? The talent. So if Kim Kardashian is useful, anyone can be useful. <laughs> that's why you need to think about back to your school. Anyone can become useful, but they, you need to attach something else. It's called creativity and how to create value for others. Our children are born creative. All children are born, but their creativity has to be disciplined. That's our challenge. It's, uh, we end up in our schools, we end up losing our children's creativity because we, we teach them to comply. And 98% of our children are born creative at the genius level. Genius level. Then once they become better students, they decline. All right, so my age five, 98 percent, age 10, 30 some percent. It means elementary school we lose a lot of them. How do we lose them? What does creativity mean? Creativity means coming up with new options. But in our schools, we teach them answers. We teach them the problem. We teach them the answer They comply. They will never change. So they, they lose the creativity because we reward compliance in our schools. That should, so the better they, the better they meet national standards, perhaps the less creative they become. That's a great students seldom make great innovators or great makers, okay? It doesn't mean innovation creativity does not need knowledge. Knowledge comes after the passion. You, you want to go after that. So this is the second thing I want you to think about how do you maintain creativity by not teaching? Again, new research shows the more you teach, the more you teach, the less creative children become, the less curious they become. The earlier you give them some answer, the less likely actually they're going to become creative. Because children, like adults, you know, you know like we want to be lazy. Human beings are fundamental, like all animals, want to be lazy. If I know what exactly you want from me and in order to get my five daughters from, you know, I, won't, I would like to do that. If you ask me, that's why the, your, some children really get annoyed by you, said, you know, what do you want? Children say, what do you want me to do? I would do it. Remember those things? You tell them, I don't want to, to do anything. They actually get annoyed by those because human beings want to a lazy way out. So there's actually a lot of research showing for four-year-olds, if you give them the answer fast, they really become less creative and less curious because they're waiting for the answer, waiting for the, for the solution. Then another one, the point is, is entrepreneurial. There are no jobs you want to create. Our children are entrepreneurial. But entrepreneur means what? Means you are able to create value for other people. Creative and value, this is called citizenship. You, your value, we need to teach our children lies in the value you create for others. 
lies in that you know what problems to solve. You solve other people's problems. So I want to bring back this together. There are really three things. Uniqueness. Every child is unique in combining what they have and exceptional. They cannot just be unique. They have to be exceptional in their own way. So no standards, no testing can measure that. You can no, no standard. So they have to, everybody is exceptional. Everybody is creative because they have to solve problems. That's not there. We call creativity invention. So we call identify problems worth solving. It's not about problem solving. If you know what problems are worth solving, you actually already you can reach the answer. Our schools teach problem solving skills. That's not important. PISA, uh, the test, claims to measure problem solving skills. Singapore was number one. I was in there. I said, yes, you know how to solve a problem, but do you know what problem is worth solving? <laughs> That's probably more important. Right? If, because today, if you, if you identify the problem, you can always get a machine to do it. You can outsource to somebody else. I, I'm, I'm working for this uh, foundation called the, the Lemosin Foundation. It's, they won't encourage invention education. We think we need inventors. The first question is, that, do you know what to invent? What problems you want to solve? Do you know how hard it is to ask our children to identify problems worth solving? I'm working with about 40 schools in Australia, uh, about 13, 14 in Queensland, I'm not Queensland, in South Australia, independent schools, two networks of government schools in, uh, in uh, Western Sydney and one in Victoria. What we're trying to say, Get kids to identify problem worth solving. No. They've been given problems, they've been given answers. But unless we know how to do it, we're not gonna, it's not gonna work in the future. And then actually, what we do now, I'm trying to help and I said, problem worth solving is, are those problems that's gonna better other people's lives. So that's called entrepreneurship. If you know how to better other people's lives, your life will be okay. How do you build a connection? But our children, it's so hard for them to even to think from other people's perspective. Other people have problems. So, so now, here's one thing. I want to end this. And uh, by the way, if you want more information about me, I'm sure you can find me if you care. And uh, uh, they are, but here's a, a web address. I want to give you some example. I'm working with um, a group of people. Actually, it's one individual who identified a problem worth solving. It's called John Kathleen. And I'll show you the website. If, uh, if the website is actually, you can write nice, edcorps.org, E-D-C-O-R-P-S dot O-R-G. This, um, this person is a philanthropist himself, has uh, inherited the money. He always wants to help schools. And he tried to give, he thinks entrepreneur education is very important. He just, just didn't find a way to do it. And he said, until I read my book, he found a way to do it. I feel so good about it. He might, might, he might be lying, but I, I like the idea that's to be liked by somebody. And, and so what he did, he created a platform called uh, Education Corporations. Then he gives about $1,000 to teachers who wants to turn their school project into the market, into products that can solve other people's problems. And so this is what uh, we have seen, the work is done, so one of them is called, uh, this is Ed Corp's Sugar Kids Beauty. Sugar Kids Beauty is, uh, is one of such companies, one of education corporations, and uh, it's year one student, year one student from Georgia, Rome, Georgia, in a very poor area. And so they would have a lot of achievement gaps in reading and math. About, I think, 80% free reduced lunch. That's one of the measures in America. <coughs> and most African American, so people wouldn't believe these kids can do anything because they can't barely read it from broken families. This one teacher actually took the money and have the children develop the company. The company makes those uh, sh sugar scraps, beauty scraps. Remember I talked about psychological needs? You don't need it, but women need, we think they need it. But you know, so the, uh, the children make them and then the children divide them into different groups. There are marketers, uh, kind of packaging people, write note stories. They've sold for seventeen thousand dollars. A one group of kids, one year, one one year, actually one term, to fifty states, nine countries. They're not sent to their parents. They get online, sold them. Now this year one student, they have to decide what to do with seventeen thousand dollars. They form a committee to, to make a decision to say we want to give this to charity, local charity, want to buy food for local people. 
And now, the, of course, it's very successful, and they, they, they won the Paul Allen Award. These children went to address the legislators of Georgia, like your parliament, and they did, the children did keynote speeches for the uh, conferences. What changed this whole thing? They earned a lot more than basically being able to read one more story. Children gain confidence. Children gain value. They learn about working with others. I'm good at packaging. I'm good with, you know, kind of mixing. They're mixer mixologists. There are people who are writing stories. They're all developed. There are about 200 uh, of this school, of this corporations now. And I'm working with them. We're trying to reach to the all, we'll go to a million dollar pledge. We want every big company to support our children, to start from them. So education, come to an end, is that help children discover problems worth solving. And the knowledge is there, as you know. You don't need to teach. Children can learn. You create. Remember, you can YouTube, Twitter. You can learn. If you want to learn, you can. So knowledge is never imposed upon. You should always sought after. So if every child in our system becomes an independent, creative, responsible, entrepreneur citizen, we will actually have a better future. And education can do that. So we need to get rid of the imposition, start supporting children. You, educators, become what called life coaches. Do you guys know what life coaches do? Life coaches do not tell you what you don't have. Life coaches said, you can do this. Here's the opportunity you can use that. We look, we are, we are kind of mentors, advisors. So just to end this whole thing, if we do not want Donald Trump, <laughs> we need a lot more independent, confident children and citizens. Thank you. Thank you.